Hello, welcome to Furious Driving, and today we're in another car which has been killed by the SUV phenomena. This is the Renault Laguna, a car which ran from 1994 until 2015, over three full generations, but now is no more. Well, I say it's no more, it was replaced by the Talisman, but when did you last see one of those? Incidentally, this Laguna is in no way related to the 1973 to 1976 uh, Chevy Chevelle Laguna. That was just a trim level, not a French saloon. Proud to be sponsored by Diamond Bright, the car care products that have been keeping the Furious fleet looking their best for a long time already. To find all you need to keep your car clean and protected, follow the link below to diamondbright.co.uk. car which ran from 1994 until 2015, over three full generations, but now is no more. Well, I say it's no more. It was replaced by the Talisman, but when did you last see one of those? And today I'm back in the 1990s in, well, one of the big deal of a car back when it was launched in 1994. Because back at that time, the Fleet family car was a big deal. However, if you didn't want to go for the obvious choice of the Mondeo or the Vectra, or Cavalier, I guess as it may even have been at some point, then there were a couple of other more left field, more interesting, more Gallic options. One of them being this, the Laguna from Renault. Now, just seeing it parked in the car park or driving past in the street, the Laguna was already off to a good start because, well, let's face it, it looks good. But that's not to say the others were bad looking by any means because no, they weren't. Mondeo in particular was particularly good looking. However, the Laguna did have that ace up its sleeve in a big way because really it was a very good looking car. It wasn't exciting looking, but it was very pretty indeed. And this is because it came from the pen of a gentleman we've encountered previously on this channel, Patrick Lequemont. You may have seen his work when we've done a Sierra, when we've done uh, Avantine. He also did things like the Twingo as well. It's often the case that when there is a, a big name like him, then the cars are very recognisable and have a bit more personality than when they're designed by a bit more of a committee. Look at Frank Stevenson's cars. Dare I even say it, Chris Bangle. So yes, it's 1995, 6, 7. You're in the market for a new company car. You can choose yourself either a dynamically perfect Mondeo, but so did everyone else. You can uh, follow your fleet instincts and buy yourself a cheap to run Vectra. You could go a bit more ultra reliable, get something like a Nissan Primera, or if you want absolute comfort, this is the place to be, the Laguna. Because although the Laguna wasn't a sharp handling, and there's no way of arguing around that, it wasn't as sharp handling as some of its rivals, again, the Mondeo is a case in point, it was astonishingly comfortable. And I'm sitting here right now, just cruising down a B road, and it is the most relaxed I've been all week. <laughs> it's fantastic. These seats, oh, you sink into them and you think that's not gonna be supportive, but somehow it is. It's supportive and comfortable at the same time. It really is good. And I think it's a fairly safe assumption that anyone else driving this car is gonna feel very much the same. Now this car is not for sale yet. It will be for sale very shortly at Stone Cold Classics at Rotem and Kent, link in the description below. It is currently being prepped for sale, but I had to drive it immediately as soon as I saw it because I just kind of felt like the moment someone sees this car and it goes onto the website, it's gonna be gone. So even though it's not fully ready yet, I had to take it out for a drive before someone snaps it up and <laughs> takes it away from me. So the Laguna replaced the 21, which was a well-known favorite of the family car breed of the, uh, the 1980s into the, into the 1990s. Development work began in 1987 and design work began in 1988. That's where our friend Patrick comes in. The basic design was signed off in 1989 and it was frozen in place in 1990, which is astonishingly fast turnaround for a new car design. Generally, these things take a long time. The gestation period of a car is, is multiple, multiple years. So like a three and a half, four year turnaround is astonishing. The next three years, 1993 to 1993, was spent testing, refining, improving, until it was revealed to the public in November 1993, and finally put on sale in January 1994. 
take a quick break from our commentary because this roundabout is where I nearly lost the back end of a Capri at 20 miles an hour once. Let's see how this thing goes. Rolls, sticks, grips, goes. This ride is absolutely amazing. It is just so smooth. Now this road looks like it's been recently resurfaced, so it's not quite as terrible as it usually is. Even though there aren't that many bumps to soak up, I'm feeling oh, magic carpet ride. The French do this so well. No other nation's cars seem to just glide along the way a French car does. It uses front struts and a torsion beam rear axle for that oh-so-French ride quality. The steering has got just the right amount of power assistance. Incidentally, if you were in your company car market and you're looking at what your budget would have got you back in, what, 1994, 95? These were relatively well equipped. There were three engines at launch, 1.8 eight valve, a two litre, and a three litre V6. With the 1.8 eight valve, the Laguna is packing 90 horsepower, giving a nought to 60 of 13.2 seconds and a top speed of 111. But with the 16 valve from 1998, that went up to 120 horsepower for a 10.60 to 60 and 125 mile an hour top speed. There were only two trim levels per engine and they, they kind of overlapped as you went up the tree. But even from the outset, they were well equipped. All models got power steering, all models got remote central locking, and they all got electric front windows. Later on, a lot more came in. Most of them had a driver's airbag, but that gradually became standard and more airbags became standard, as did more and more other trim as time went on. You'll notice this one doesn't have air conditioning, which of course would have become a more standard thing as the decades rolled on. As the range went along, there were lots more engines, a 1.6 litre slotted in below the rest of the other engines. A 1.8 16 valve replaced the 8 valve, which was obviously a bit more refined and a bit more powerful. The 3 litre V6 was initially only available with an automatic, which is a bit of a shame if you wanted all that power but wanted some control as well. And it wasn't until a few years later that you could pop a manual gearbox on it and actually enjoy driving it rather than enjoy being slushed along. Also, crucially for the fleet market, there were some diesel engines as well. There were 1.9 and 2.2 litre turbo diesels, and even a 2.2 non-turbo diesel, which made a whole 85 horsepower. It was sluggish, but wow, it was economical. This is probably the most common car you will find of the survivors of this breed, the 1.8 RT, which is the mid-range engine, 16 valve, so I've got my airbag, I've got my electric windows, electric mirrors, I've got electric sunroof, remote central locking, which is nice. So this generation was replaced in 2000 by the Mark II, and the Mark II was replaced by the Mark III in 2007, and the entire Laguna line was ultimately superseded in 2015 by the Talisman, which is a stunning looking saloon. But I think I can count on the fingers of one foot how many I've seen on the roads in the UK. I think maybe I've seen one, possibly. Now there's a Volkswagen Artemis. No, it wasn't a but. And that's a shame because it's an absolutely beautiful car and deserves to do way better than it currently is. If it's still even going at all, actually. I'm not sure it's been continued. Now I'm not sure I've got my seat set up exactly perfectly, but despite that, it's not a bad sitting position. The pedals are nicely spaced for someone with a fairly good sized feet. The steering wheel feels nice. It's rubber, not leather, but it does have a good tactile feel to it. The main parts of the dashboard are a little far away, but I like the way but it is very, very elegant, the way everything is hidden behind these panels and you have to roll it back to find your Blauplunk stereo. Visibility is very good, but this A-post is huge and it does kind of catch the corner of your eye quite a lot. And being an Alpha 145 driver, I am rather taken with these large door-mounted air vents. They're a bit more effective than the ones in the Alpha as well, even though this car is about the same age. The, well, the design is the same age. Now, as you might have noticed from the sticker in the back window, Renault were pretty big in motorsport back in the 1990s. And they even campaigned these, the Lagunas, in touring cars. Now, here in the BTCC in the UK, Tim Harvey was brought on as their star driver. And uh, it's quite interesting hearing him talk about the first time he saw the car. He was taken to the garage to see the car for the first time where the engineers have been tinkering away, but 
what transpired is they built a touring car for luxury rather than for speed. He said it looked like it was on stilts and he had to go and explain to the engineers that they were going to have to take it down about three inches. But with his help of refining and developing it, it actually became quite a competitive touring car. There are photos of these things literally up on two wheels. Not long ago, Motorsport magazine did a very interesting interview with him talking about those days and it is hilarious listening to that. Right, let's pull off and take a quick look around the outside and the interior. Now looking around the outside of this car, it can only be a product of the 1990s. It is just so smooth, so flowing, no exaggerated sharp edges like you find on modern designs, but just simplicity of design. It's beautiful. This small bonnet beak here and these pointed little headlights, they could almost have come straight from an Alfa Romeo. And you'll notice this clamshell bonnet, which is also seen in some of the smaller Renaults, like the Clio from the early 90s as well. Moving back down the car, hubcaps. No alloy wheels. This is clearly the mid 90s and around the front and the back these black plastic inserts in the bumpers and of course down here just to remind you you should have paid a little bit more for the optional extra or the next trim level up. Blanking plates instead of fog lights. However the car does have a huge glass area. Electric sunroof, big tinted windows so inside the car it's always comfortable. It's just a lovely lovely place to be. The design is simple but it's elegant. It just works really really well. Let's take a look inside. Now, climbing aboard, we have these lovely lozenge-shaped oval uh, door handles, which just pull out like that. Nice and easy to get into. And these door cards are really rather lovely. Lots of plastic, of course. It is the 1990s, but we've got two tones of plastic. It's not the nicest feeling stuff, but back at this decade, it never really was. But a huge plastic door handle, big plastic door pull. And over in front of that, electric front windows, electric mirrors, and this great big air vent tucked here into the door itself. The large air vents coming out of the dashboard assembly into the door to blow out here and up onto the window. So hopefully not getting misted up windows at any time. And we do also have a big speaker grill down here. Now moving into the car itself, we don't have any interesting fancy kick plates, nothing exciting down there, but we do have a pull for the, for the fuel release. And then most importantly, we have all of the velour. The 90s was the decade of the velour, where not only did we get the extreme comfort of this amazing material, which is just the best, smoothest, softest, warmest, loveliest fabric ever created, but also we've got these incredible 1990s geometric designs. This is basically a grey chair, but it's also got dark grey, light grey, light blue, all these interlocking geometric patterns, which are, I don't know, you could while away the hours trying to work out what shapes you're looking at squares, circles, triangles, all interlocking there. It's MTV on a chair. Wow, love them, absolutely fabulous. And we've got the same fabric here on the door card as well. Now moving over into the dashboard itself, we've got a big steering wheel, surprisingly large steering wheel, I have to say. It's hard rubber or plastic rather than leather, but it's hard wearing, will never wear out. Got a little tiny, tiny, tiny Renault logo in the center. If you look how big, car company logos are now on steering wheels and grills and things. They really are just shouting about everything. Back in the 90s, little tiny deal. It's also got an airbag in it. Love that little curvy French script, beautiful. And of course the horn, horn test. Wow, that's a dynamic horn. Very good. Now let's move forward again. We've got rather interesting control stalks down here. So first of all, we've got indicators, lights and horn. Horn again, so a multiple horn switches, horn on the steering wheel, horn on the stalk, who knew? That also gives us our fog lights and our front lights and our indicators. Over on the right hand side, we have got our wipers front and rear. But also being a Renault, these controls were there for literally decades. All the radio controls are over here on this big chunky obelisk on the side of the steering wheel. And tucked away in the corner behind our, our wiper stalk is first of all a couple of little tiny rolling dials, one for your air vent in the door and one for your headlamp aim height. And above that, a little tiny rubber footed crescent shaped place for tucking bits and pieces. It's a really small, odd shaped thing. It's not big enough for your sweets. It's barely big enough for any change. I'm guessing being French, it's for your cigarette lighter so you can light your jetains on the road. Moving back and up, we've got our dials, our instruments, lovely clear analog dials, redlining, 6,000 RPM on this 
semicircular sweep just there. In the center, our speedometer going up to 140 miles an hour and showing, of course, 27,700 miles on the clock. This car has barely lived. And finally, a fuel gauge and a temperature gauge. And of course, we've got a few warning lights hidden in there. Stop and service included. Moving up from that, we have our T-shelf. If you want to make a quick baguette away, <laughs> excuse me, we've got a nice little area here where your daily sandwich can sit in security. It's penned in front, back and sides. So if you want to put your lunch on there for later, that will live there quite happily despite some fairly heavy cornering. So that's a great bit of tea shelfery. You can pop a cup there, pop a sandwich there. You're good to go. Further up here, we've got a large hidden air vent on the back of this blowing all the way across the width of the screen. We have got tweeters tucked up in the corners, which is a great position for a tweeter because it fires up and reflects back off the glass. We have got our clock hidden under this little cowl here. It feels like there should be more just there. I think maybe on the better Spectre models, there was a bit more going on, but just here, it's a small flat area and a tiny little digital clock. As I say, a very tiny little digital clock. Below that, we've got two massive air vents, very similar to the ones in the door. Air vintage was clearly a priority for the designers of the interior on this car. And that is above a fairly, well, incredibly basic uh, centre console. I, I'm, basic is the wrong word, minimalist is the right word. This is not a lack of content, this is a deliberate decision to uh, make it as simple and uncluttered and as elegant as possible. I guess these guys would have loved to have been able to put a touch screen in here, but that didn't exist back then, thank goodness, because we do get actual proper dials for your heating and ventilation. Just one extra button for your heated rear window. I guess if there was air conditioning, that would be just there. Sadly, there isn't. Curious positioning for the button to open the glove box. Push that button there, glove box comes open. Space for two small cups and a large Twix, I think. Yeah. All good. So. Underneath this big black plastic area, flip it up, we have got our Blaupunkt Renault branded stereo. Considering this is a 90s thing, it looks very, very 1980s. So many small round buttons and functions going on here. Source, balance, fade, treble, bass, DX, low, LD, I think that says. Eject, obviously, because it's a radio cassette. And then our little panel here for station pre-select, FM, medium wave, long wave. Yeah, I wonder what flower pump model this is under the lid. Below that we've got a big cubby hole so I guess there would have been an audio option so you could have a graphic equaliser or perhaps a CD player tucked in there as well but not on this one. Rep spec. Oh I like the action on that. Our flip down and drop into the console cover on the ashtray and our 12 volt socket. A little awkward to get to. That has never been used. That's fantastic. Always good to see cars that's never been smoked in. That's always very nice. And this whole thing isn't the nicest to touch plastic, but it does look absolutely amazing. Behind that, we have got a proper five-speed manual gearbox, which is actually rather nice to use. Clunks through the gears quite pleasantly, has to be said. Behind which we'll find a proper handbrake. And this is quite interesting. Central locking down here on that. You'll notice how flush those things sit when they lock. And of course, the position of the hazard warning lights. Slightly curious place to put that. But I guess it keeps it off our nice minimalistic dashboard by popping it down by the handbrake. Now behind the handbrake, we've got another slot coin slot because slots for coins were an enormous deal back in the 90s. A little strange stipple based cubby area for God knows what. Put a small amount of Coca-Cola in there, drink it with a straw while you're driving, I guess. Up above, we've got our electric sunroof. We've also got bits of our 1990s security system on show there, so infrared. And of course, our light switches. Right, let's have a look in the back of this thing. Now moving to the back, you'll notice our Renault security warning thing. If you've stolen this car, please call this number so let us know where it is, or something. Similar oval door handle, climb in. Once again, virtually the same door card, a little bit of velour, hard plastic, flush mounting door lock. But this time we've got no electric windows. We've got quite nice rubber stippled end on there. Cranky window windows, climb in. Uh, nice space actually. Lots of room for your knees, 
quite low on my toes actually, so my toes are basically clamped. So although I've got a lot of knee space, my feet are kind of pushed back kind of this far. So this is really only good for people with very, very small toes. The seats though are extremely comfortable. You sink into these as well. They're soft yet supportive once more. The no seat back storage though, not bad headroom, a little bit tight here in the back. And we do have a, whoops, a daisy couple out. We do have a nice velour armrest, which is excessively comfortable. Our only other toy in the back because the speakers are over there in the rear parcel shelf is a little nice little action on that this rear panel to hide the fact there's a messy mounting area just there that's sprung loaded so it comes up hides the business lovely now clambering into the boot large button just there which is not the most ergonomic way of doing things because you have to push the button then lift the lid and you have got a huge amount of space back here the retmobiles family cars of the 90s were amazing load luggers and because the whole hatchback thing was going on it meant you could just squeeze so much stuff in here space in here i guess probably for a first kit, aid kit or similar that's not just there under the carpet there will be, will be a full spare wheel but nothing else really to bother you in terms of luxury but basically that's just a massive massive space for carting all your goodies now curiously for a french car because normally they put the uh, bonnet release on the driver's side for france it's under air and here we have the 1.8 litre, I think this will be the 8 valve being a 1995 car, there was a 16 valve later on. But look how empty this engine bay is compared to a modern car. So little in the way of electronics and computers and what have you. You can see the floor through there. You can see loads of the floor through there. And performance figures and economy basically haven't changed in 25 years. But the amount of weight and stuff being carried is just phenomenal. So this is the Laguna, a car that was a prince of its time and now a victim of time itself. It really is a nice, comfortable car. If you want a car to do miles in, actually travel a long way, as sales reps of the 90s would have been, you could do a lot worse than one of these at the time. And even today, this is oh so luxurious. This car's only got, well, less than 28,000 miles on it. And it is really, really nice. The 1.8 might not sound like a big engine, but really, it's plenty of power for the handling. And it feels well put together, despite the reputation of French cars for not being as well screwed together as, say, their German counterparts. This does feel good. It does feel solid on the road, and there are virtually no rattles and squeaks and things. That's my feet squeaking right now. No wind noise, no rattle. It's great. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this look around this now becoming rare slice of 1990s motoring. If you've enjoyed, please, as always, hit like and subscribe and join me again next time driving something completely different.